thanks very much for the introduction and um, thanks for the invitation to speak. It's a um, great pleasure to be at this, at this workshop. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, a particle system and a related PDE called a free boundary problem. And I'm going to try and show you what we can prove about the particle system using the connection with the free boundary problem. Um, and this is all going to be based on, on joint work with um, Julian Berestiki, who's at Oxford, but also hiding at the back, and um, Eric Brunet, who's at the ENS in Paris, and um, Jim Merlin, who's at, who's at Duke. Um, so, so this is the, the particle system that um, I want to talk about. So it's, um, we call it the, the Brownian Bs process, but you could also see it as an example of an N particle branching around in motion or NBBM. So the, the particle system consists of n particles that move around in RD for any positive integer D that we want to choose. And so they, they move around according to independent Brownian motions, but also each particle is carrying with it a clock that has an independent exponentially distributed amount of time on it with, with mean one. And when that time runs out, so when the clock rings, um, the particle branches into two particles. But whenever a particle in the system branches, then the particle in the system that is furthest from the origin in terms of Euclidean distance, that that particle is killed. So there are always exactly n particles in the system at, at all times. Um, so in the pictures on the right, I'm gonna try and show you what, what the process might look like for, for d equals two and n equals five. And the, the black dot in the middle is meant to be the origin. So um, the, the particles move around according to their independent Brownian motions until one of them decides to branch, so maybe that's the blue particle. And then what we do is um, see which particle is furthest from the origin. So that's, um, oh, it really doesn't work. Uh, that's this one here. Um, and so then that particle is killed and the blue particle branches into two, all the other particles continue to move according to their, their brand motion. So we still have um, five particles in the system. So, so this is the particle system I'm gonna be talking about for, for most of the talk. And then towards the end, I'm going to say something about some, some related models and some conjectures um, that are related to the, the results I'm gonna tell you about. Um, and just to, to flag up that um, all the way through the talk, um, my Brownian motions are going to be sped up by a factor of two, or in other words, they're gonna have diffusivity square root of two. Um, and that's just so that I don't end up with a lot of coefficient a halves in my um, PDs. Um, and a bit of notation, so I'm going to write xn of t for the vector of particle positions in our Brownian Bs at time t. So x1 n of t up to xn n of t, so each x i n of t is a position in Rd. Um, and I'm going to write mn t for the maximum distance of a particle from the origin at time t. So it's the maximum from i equals 1 up to n of the norm of x i n of t. And I'm always going to write norm to mean um, L2 or Euclidean norm. And I'm going to write mu n of dx and t for the empirical measure of the particle positions at time t. So I'll give each particle a mass one over n, and then I'll sum from k equals one to n and put a, a point mass at the position of the, the kth particle at time t. Um, so that's our, our particle system. And then as I said, it turns out to be related to um, a free boundary problem. So here's our free boundary problem. Um, so we've got an initial probability measure um, mu naught on Rd. And then we've got a pair of unknowns, u and r. So u is a function of, of x in rd and time t, and r is just a function of t. And so you can think of r as determining the position of an unknown moving boundary. And we want these, these two unknowns to solve this system of, of four equations. So, so first of all, we want u to solve a PDE um, inside the ball of radius rt, centered at the origin. And we want u to, to solve a boundary condition. So we want u to be zero on the, on the boundary of that ball. So at distance rt from the origin. And at all times t, we want the integral of u at time t to be um, constant equal to one. And then we want u to converge to the initial condition mu naught in a, in a suitable sense as, as t goes to zero. So <clears throat> it's gonna turn out that we can think of um, u as being, so um, if n is very large in our brand in b's, we can think of um, u of x and t as being roughly the density of particles at location x and at time t. And we can think of rt as being roughly the, the largest particle distance from the origin at time t. So, so why would we then end up with this system of equations? 
Well, the first equation is just saying that if you're within distance RT of the origin, so then you're, you're closer to the origin than the furthest particle distance from the origin. So there, particles are not being killed. They're just moving around happily according to Brownian motions and branching into two particles at, at rate one. And so the, the equation from the, for the density is just having a, a Laplacian U term from the motion according to Brownian motion and a plus U because um, particles are, are branching at, at rate one into two particles. And then what the second equation is saying is that at distance RT from the origin, which is roughly the maximum particle distance from the origin, at that distance, particles are being killed. And so the second equation is just saying that the density there is, um, density of particles is, is equal to zero there. And then the third equation is saying that the integral of the density of particles, or in other words, the, the total mass of particles is constant and equal to one. Um, and that's just because in our particle system, we've always got um, exactly n particles. And then the, the fourth equation is, is just an initial condition. Um, so, so first of all, it's, it's not at all obvious that the solution to this system of equations exists, but it turns out that it does and, and it's unique. Um, so we can show that for any Borel probability measure mu naught on RD, then there's a, a unique and um, global solution U and R to this um, free boundary problem, this, this system of equations. Yep. Why the evolution is so isotropic? There's no symmetry in the initial condition? So are you saying it's more it's symmetric just a, than you expect or less? RT, just, just a sphere. Well, it's because the the um, definition of the particle system is is isotropic in that way, in that you're always killing the the one that's the furthest from the origin in terms of Euclidean distance. So. Yeah, but the, the macroscopic equation, it, it, a free boundary, which is not so isomorph is so so isotropic well but it doesn't because the killing rule is is isotropic in that way does that make sense i mean so this solution is not necessarily going to be symmetric because the initial condition isn't symmetric but um but the the boundary the boundary is uh so we're, um yeah so so there is a unique and global solution and we can also show that for this unique solution then um, this function RT, um, at the unknown RT is, is finite and it's also continuous at, at all positive times T. And we can also show that the limit as, as T goes to zero of RT exists. Um, so let's call it R naught. And it, um, we can show that it's equal to the infimum of R such that um, mu naught of, so I'm going to write B of R for the, the open ball of radius R centered at the origin. So, so R naught is the infimum of R such that mu naught um, puts mass one on the on the ball of radius r, and you can see that. So, for example, if if mu naught is a point mass at the origin, then um, then r zero could be could be zero. Um, but also, if if mu naught had unbounded support, then it's possible that that r zero is is infinite. Um, so so then our our first um, main result about the particle system um, uh, connects it to the the free boundary problem. So it's a, a hydrodynamic limit result. Um, so, so what we can show is that if mu naught is a Borel probability measure on RD, and um, let's take our, our initial particle positions to be IID with, with distribution given by mu naught, so x1 n of zero up to x n n of zero, and let's let u and r be the solution to the free boundary problem on the previous slide um, with initial condition given by the, the measure mu naught. Then what we can say is that if we fix the time t and we take a, a measurable subset A of, of Rd, then if we take mu n of A and t, so, so mu n was the empirical measure of the, the set of particles um, at time t, so this is the proportion of the particles that are in the set A, we can show that that converges almost surely as n goes to infinity to the integral of u at time t over the set A. And we can also show that MNT, which was the maximum distance of a particle from the origin, we can show that that converges almost surely to um, RT, the, the position of the, the free boundary. So, so this is saying that if we, if we take a, a fixed time T and we take N to be really large, then the density of particles is very close to um, the solution of the, the free boundary problem U at, at time T. And also the largest particle distance from the origin is is very close to the, the free boundary position RT. So I'm sort of trying to summarize that in the, um, the boxes that the result in, in those boxes at the, at the bottom of the slide. So, so this tells us what, what um, our particle system looks like at a fixed time T if N is extremely large. Um, but then what we'd like to understand is um, more about the long-term behavior. So we'd like to fix a very large number of particles N 
and then let time t go to infinity and understand the, the behavior of the, the particle system. So maybe a good first step is to understand the long-term behavior of the, the solutions of the free boundary problem, the, the long-term behavior of the hydrodynamic limit. Um, so what we can say about the, the solutions of the free boundary problem is that it turns out that they converge to a particular steady state solution. Um, so here's our steady state solution. We've got, um, again, we've got two unknowns. So capital U is a function of X in RD and R infinity is just an, an unknown constant. Um, and we want them to solve the system of equations. So we want um, capital U to solve a PDE within the ball of um, radius R infinity. And we want it to be zero on the boundary of the ball. And we want it to be strictly positive um, inside the, the open ball. And then we also want the integral of capital U to be equal to one. So, so there's a unique choice of R infinity such that the first three equations have a, a solution. And then for that choice of um, R infinity, uh, that solution is, is unique up to a constant scaling factor. And the fourth equation tells you what that, that constant scaling factor has to be. So, so this um, solution, capital U R infinity, is a steady state solution of our free boundary problem. And it turns out that all the solutions um, converge to this, this steady state. So, so we can show that if you take an initial um, Borel probability measure mu naught, then the solution U and R of the, the free boundary problem um, satisfies that um, if you take T to infinity, then the position of the free boundary RT converges to um, this R infinity in the steady state solution. And also if you take the difference between um, little u at time t and capital U, then the L infinity norm of that difference um, converges to, to zero as, as n goes, as, sorry, as time t goes to infinity. So, so again, I'm sort of summarizing this in the, in the boxes at the bottom of the slide. So now let's go back to the particle system. Um, so we're now going to fix n and we're going to let time t go to infinity. So um, we can show that the process converges to a, a, state, a, a um, stationary distribution. So, so what we can show is that the, the process X n of t has um, a unique invariant measure, which we call pi n, um, which is a probability measure on R d to the n. And um, we can show that for any initial particle configuration, then the law of X n of t converges in, in total variation norm to pi n as, as time t goes to infinity. So, so what that means is that if you take the, um, the supremum overall Borel measurable subset C of, of R d to the n, then of the um, difference between the probability that X n of t is in C and um, pi n of C, then, then that goes to zero as, as t goes to infinity. So, so in particular, if you take a nice subset of R d to the n, then the probability that um, the Brownian B's um, particle configuration is in that subset um, at time t converges to the, the mass that pi n puts on that, on that subset. Um, so, so now we have um, this, this result that I've got on the, on the left of my boxes. So, so now a natural question to ask is um, if, um, if we let n go to infinity, then does pi n converge in some sense to this um, uh, steady state solution of our, our free boundary problem? Or in other words, is the, the long-term behavior of the particle system for large n the same as the as the long-term behavior of the, of the solutions of the free boundary problem. Um, and it turns out that the answer is yes. Um, so, so this is our main result. Um, so this is what we can prove is that if we take a, a positive epsilon and we take a measurable subset A of RD, then if we take the pi n measure of um, the, the set of um, particle configurations such that um, the proportion of particles that are in the set A is more than epsilon away from the integral of capital U over the set A, then the pi n measure of that set goes to zero as, as n goes to infinity. And also if we take the pi n measure as the set of particle configurations such that the maximum distance of the particle from the origin is more than epsilon away from R infinity, then, then the pi n measure of that set also goes to, goes to zero. So what this is saying is that if n is really, really large, then um, the, the density of particles um, under the, the pi n measure is, is um, close to U n, but sorry, close to capital U. And, um, if, if, and also if, if um, n is very large, then um, under pi n with high probability, the largest particle distance from the origin is, is going to be very close to, close to our infinity. And so, so these are our, our, sort of our main results. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit um, about the proof of our hydrodynamic limit result, um, because the, the proofs of um, 
these two results um, sort of build on, on that proof. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some, some, related, um, some related work. Um, so first of all, the, the proof of the hydrodynamic limit result. So um, it turns out that the first step in, in proving um, the hydrodynamic limit result is rather than just thinking about, rather than thinking about the, the locations of the particles in RD, first of all, we just think about the distances of the particles from the origin. So for a, a radius R and a time T, we're going to let Fn of R and T um, be mu N of the ball of radius R at time T. So this is the, the proportion of particles that are within distance R of the origin at time T. And this is sort of the, the first step um, in the proof of the hydrodynamic limit result. So what we show is that there exists a, a positive constant C1, such that if N is large enough, then the following holds. So if we take um, a, um, a particle configuration Xn in Rd to the N, so that's N particle positions in, in Rd, then let's let Un and Rn be the solution of our free boundary problem with initial condition given by the empirical measure of that particle configuration. So we give each of the particles a mass one over N, and then we sum from K equals one to N, and we put a, a delta mass at, um, the, at the position of the case particle, so at, at Xk um, N. And then we're also going to let Vn of R and T be the integral over the ball of radius R of um, Un at, at time T. So, so Vn of R and T is the amount of mass that, that Un puts inside the, the ball of radius R. Then, then what we can show is that if we take a positive time T, then so I'm writing P subscript Xn to mean that um, my initial particle configuration is, is Xn. So then we can say that the probability that the supremum overall um, radiuses are of the difference between Fn of R and T and Vn of R and T, we can say that the probability that that's at least um, e to the tt times n to the minus c1, that probability is at most e to the t times n to the minus one minus c1. So, so if you fix the time t and you take n to be really, really large, this is saying that the probability that um, Fn and Vn are, are far apart is, uh, well, the probability that they're more than a little bit apart is, is very, very small. Um, and what turns out to be important when we use this result is, so the, the, the um, function Vn of R and T depends on Xn because it depends on the initial condition for the free boundary problem. But um, these bounds here don't depend on the choice of Xn. So we have a bound that is just as good whatever your, your initial particle configuration is. Um, and the way that we prove this result builds very much on, on earlier work by Damasi, Ferrari, Prasuti, and Soprano Loto um, that I'm going to mention a bit later on. Um, but sort of using their, their, um, their ideas, we, um, um, we're able to sandwich the process of particle distances from the origin between two um, different processes in which particles are only killed at specific time steps. So the furthest particles from the origin are sort of shaved off at, at specific time steps. And those particle systems are a bit easier to control. So we essentially prove this result for those particle systems and then transfer it back to, to our, our branding beef. Um, so, so that's the, the first step in the proof. Um, and then how do we um, show our, our hydrodynamic limit result from this? Um, so I'm reminding you of what we wanted to show. So we wanted mu naught to be a, a Braille probability measure on RD, and we wanted our initial particle locations to be IID with distribution mu naught, and U and R was the solution to the free boundary problem with the initial condition given by this, this fixed measure mu naught. And essentially what we wanted to show was that the, the proportion of particles in a set A at time T converges to the, um, the integral over the set A of, of U at, at time T. Um, so then this is the, the sort of the second main intermediate result. Um, so what we show is that there exists a positive constant C2, such that if we take a little positive eta and then a bigger time capital T, then if, if N is large enough, depending on eta and capital T, then the probability that there's a time T between eta and capital T, such that MNT, the, the largest particle distance from the origin, is bigger than RT plus eta, that probability is at most um, N to the minus one minus CT. So, so that probability is going to be really small if, if n is very big. So this is saying that, that with high probability, the largest particle distance from the origin never goes 
more than this little eta that we can choose beyond the position of this deterministic um, free boundary from our, our free boundary problem. And the reason that we can only go um, on the interval eta up to t rather than zero up to t is that um, essentially that we don't have good enough control on um, rt when, when t, is, t is very small. Um, so, so we can show this using the control on the proportions of particles within distances of the origin um, that we get from the, from the previous result. Um, and once we've got this result, then we're really in business for proving our hydrodynamic limit result. And that's because once we know that with high probability, um, the, the largest particle distance from the origin is, is not beyond RT plus a little bit, that means that we can compare our Brownian bees to a, another particle system where particles are killed if they're at a deterministic distance from the origin. So they're killed if they're at distance um, more than RT plus eta from the origin at, at some time t. And this particle system is a lot easier to control because you're only killing outside of a, a deterministic boundary. And so we can show sort of something close to our hydrodynamic limit result for this system and then, and then transfer that back to our, our Brownian bees process. Um, so that was all I wanted to say about the, the proofs. And now I want to um, say a bit about some, some related work. Um, so in some sense, our, our model is a, a special case of a, a model introduced by Nathaniel Barisiki and, and Li Zhao in, in 2018. And um, so in their model, they have a, a fitness function F on the whole of RD. And again, they have N particles that are moving around um, in RD according to independent Brownian motions and they're branching into two particles at, at rate one. Um, but in their model, each time a particle branches, then the particle um, in the system with the, the lowest fitness value, where the fitness value of a particle is the function f applied to its position, so the, the particle with the lowest fitness value is, is killed. Um, and the, the cases that they actually look, look at are where f of x is given by the distance of, of x from the origin, so um, the further you are from the origin, you're higher, the higher your fitness. Um, and also for, for some fixed vector lambda where um, f of x is given by the, the scalar product of, of lambda and x. So actually these, um, they see really interesting behavior in these cases, but it's very different to what we see in the Browning bees because in each of these cases, in order to get a high fitness value, you have to be far from the origin. So, so the, the particle cloud is sort of being encouraged to, to move away from the origin. Um, and then our, our model is also very closely related to um, a model introduced by Luigi Adaraberi and Jessica Lin and Thomas Tonrov in, in 2020 um, called barycentric Brownian bees. So in the barycentric Brownian bees, again, you have N particles in RD that are moving according to independent Brownian motions and branching into two particles at, at rate one. But this time, each time a particle branches, then the particle in the system that is furthest from the, the center of mass or the barycenter of the system, that's the, the particle that's killed. So, so in our process, we have this, this fixed point, the origin, and we kill the particles furthest from this fixed point. But in the barycentric Brownian bees, you, you kill the particle furthest from the, the current center of mass of the, of the system. Um, and what they show is that um, for any n under a, a suitable diffusive rescaling, then the, the motion of this, the um, center of mass of the system converges to a, a Brownian motion. Um, and what they conjecture is that um, as um, n goes to infinity, then if you recenter by the, the, um, the particles positions by the barycenter, then the density of particles should um, converge to the same steady state solution of the free boundary problem that, that we see in, in our model. Um, and then finally, the, the final um, uh, model that I want to mention is, um, was introduced by Pascal Maillard in, in 2016. Um, but it's, it's a continuous time analog of, of branching selection systems introduced by, by Brunet and Derrida. Um, so it's the, the n-particle branching branching motion or NBBM. Um, and it consists of n particles on the real line. And they are again, moving according to independent branching motions and branching into two particles at, at rate one. Um, and each time that a particle in the system branches, then um, the leftmost particle in the system is killed. So this is a, a cloud of particles that's gradually moving to the right along the, along the real line. So, so a bit of notation. So we'll write xn of t for the vector of, of particle positions on the real line at time t. So it turns out that the NBBM also has a, a hydrodynamic limit, which is given by the solution of a, a free boundary problem. Um, so, so this is the free boundary problem. 
Um, so let's suppose that we have an initial um, probability density function rho naught on the real line. And again, we've got two unknowns. So we've got R and, uh, sorry, rho and L. So rho is a function of um, X in the real line and time T. And uh, L is a function of, <laughs> of time T. Uh, so L is a, an unknown moving boundary. Um, so we want rho to solve this PDE to the right of L. And we want rho to be equal to zero at, at LT. And we want the integral of rho at time t to always be equal to one. And then we want the initial condition to be given by, given by rho naught. So, so it turns out that if n is very large, then um, rho of x and t is roughly the um, density of, of particles at location x and at time t in the, in the NVBM. And LT is roughly the, the position of the leftmost particle. So then why do we end up with this system of equations? Well, it's, it's quite similar to the um, heuristic for the previous free boundary problem. So for the first equation, this is particles that are to the right of roughly where the leftmost particle is. Particles are being killed if, they're the left, the, if they are the leftmost particle. So, so particles in, in this region are not being killed. They're just moving according to Brownian motions and branching at rate one. So um, we have the Laplacian term and the plus rho term. And then the second equation is, um, um, appears because um, this is saying that the density of particles is zero at roughly the position of the leftmost particle, because that's the, where the particles are being killed. And then the third equation is saying that the total mass of particles is, is always um, equal to one because they're always exactly n particles. And then the fourth equation is just an initial condition. So, so it turns out that um, solutions to this system of equations, um, they exist and they're unique. And then it's a result of Damasi, Ferrari, Prusitti, and Soprano Lotto from 2017 that says that um, this um, pre boundary problem is the hydrodynamic limit of the, the NVBM. So, so if we suppose that our particle positions at time zero are IID with density given by rho naught, then if you take a, a, um, a position on the real line X and a time T, then if you take one over N times the number of I such that X I N of T is greater than or equal to X, or in other words, the, the proportion of particles that are to the right of x, that converges almost surely as, as n goes to infinity to the integral from x to infinity of, of rho at time t. So in other words, the, the density of particles is, is roughly given by, given by rho. Um, so this is what's known about the NVBM. And then I just wanted to, to finish by giving you some, some conjectures. So the, the first conjecture is, is very closely related to um, the results that I told you about for the brown and beef. Um, so, so as I said on the previous slide, this, this hydrodynamic limit result is, is known. Um, so I'm writing mu n um, for, the, for the empirical measure of the particles in the, the NVBM. Um, it's also known that if you fix n and you let time t go to infinity, then the NVBM viewed from the position of the leftmost particle converges to a, a stationary distribution that depends on n. Um, so then how about solutions of this free boundary problem? Well, in this case, there's a, an infinite set of traveling wave solutions, um, but it's, it's conjectured that if you take a, an initial condition that is compactly supported, um, then the, the solution of the free boundary problem should converge to the traveling wave with minimal wave speed. But that's, as far as I know, that's, that's not known. And then, um, so, so that would be sort of one, one conjecture and then a, a, a potentially, well, probably harder conjecture to prove would be this. So to show that um, under the stationary distribution, the, the shape, the density of the cloud of particles converges to this particular um, minimal traveling wave. Um, and this is sometimes called a, a selection principle because it would be saying that the particle system and the free boundary problem or, and the solutions to the free boundary problem both select the same traveling wave to determine their, their long-term behavior. Um, so, so that's one conjecture. And then another one that I just want to, wanted to mention as well um, is due to Brunet, Derrida, Muller, and Minier. And so that if you run the NVBM, or well, um, if, you, if you run your NVBM for a, a very long time, um, and then you, you take a, a sample um, from the particle system and trace its ancestry backwards in time, then you get a coalescent process. Um, and it, it's conjectured that if you look at this coalescent process on a log n cubed timescale, 
then what you should see in the limit as, as n goes to infinity is a, a bolt hasn't snip bond coalescence. Um, and this has been proved for a, a related model. So there's a work of um, Beresvicki, Beresvicki and Schwanzberg, where they study a, a particle system in which um, particles are killed if they go below a, a deterministic curve and a deterministic curve, which is cleverly chosen so that um, there are roughly n particles in the system. Um, so, so it's been proved in for, for that um, particle system, but as far as I know, it seems to be quite, quite hard to prove it for the, for the NVVM itself. So, um, so hopefully that gives you an idea that there are still lots of open questions about the, the NVVM. Um, and I think that was, that was all I wanted to say. So thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Sarah. I'm sure there are questions or comments. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Uh, I am uh, curious about the, um, com the selection principle of your this problem. So do you have a unique uh, invariant measure for the equation, a unique invariant? Uh, so in, in, in your square that is completed, you converge from yeah. the stationary distribution to yeah. something that is stationary for the equation, right? Yes. Uh, this stationary solution is unique stationary solution for the um, equation, or you have so it's kind of the also. it's kind of the only sensible stationary distribution, yeah, uh -huh. and and it's the one that all the all the um, all the solutions of the PDE converge to that. Uh, okay. So so in many ways it's kind of a, a toy version it's, of the the problem for the NVBM because it's so much easier because we have this okay. nice property that everything converges um, to the same one. So yeah. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, in your proof, you mentioned that you're, you compare with the, the case where you have a fixed uh, killing boundary. Uh, yeah. And yes. yeah. I mean, is it enough to do just this, or do you have to do it also with a, like a boundary at RT minus eta or something like this? Or? Um, yeah, it, it so, seems it so, gives only one bound. Yeah, or... yeah. I guess I didn't really go into that. So, so what helps here is that um, you know that you always have n particles, and so actually, what you can show is that um, so so you end up only needing one bound um, because once you show that this particle um, doesn't have much more than n particles in it, and you know that probably all of your Brown and B's particles are among those n plus a little bit particles then you don't actually need to do anything else. Does, does that make sense? Because you know that you have n particles and you know that they are, um, you've got n plus little of n particles that they have to be n of. So, so actually you don't have to do any extra work, which is nice. Okay. <laughs> Just for the first model you, you mentioned at the beginning, yeah. the, is it not that the genealogy is the, the king man Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we haven't actually proved this, but um, but yes, I would strongly believe that the genealogy would be king one for the for the brand Yeah. Well, questions? Doesn't seem to be the case. Let's thank both speakers. Okay.